All right, the part of the passage I want to focus in on here in Matthew chapter 20 is the part where um, the brother of J or the, the brother, the mother of James and John come to Jesus. That's who it says when it says in verse 20, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons. And the, you know, the sons of Zebedee are James and John. And um, so her mother comes, their mother comes to Jesus and uh, he asks her, you know, well, what, what do you want? What wilt thou? And she saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. So she's asking for the, you know, basically for great positions for her, for her sons in the afterlife, in, in the kingdom of God. That, you know, you're going to have Jesus Christ and then my two children at your right and left hand. Now, it's not wrong to be, um, you know, desirous of, of a good office, especially like that. I mean, in the kingdom of God, why not want to be in, in a great position in God's kingdom? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing sinful about that. Now, he's asking, like, do you really know what you're asking me of? You know, like, like this isn't some light thing to be in that type of position in the kingdom of God. Like, it's not, that's, this isn't just something that's real flippant or, to, you know, and it makes the other uh, disciples angry. To it. In verse number 24, it says, And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Like, who do you think you are? You know, what do you... But look, there's a lot of things we can learn from this. We all ought to be striving to be the greatest Christian, right? We, want, we ought to be trying to be just the, you know, like the Apostle Paul said, that, that he presses forth, that he might, you know, attain the mark, you know, that, that, he's, that he's set for the, the prize of the, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, that... That, that he is, is continuing, he's got his eyes focused on the prize. He wants to win. He wants to end his life winning and, and doing as much as he humanly possibly can do to, you know, to, to reach the finish line and to reach it first. He wants, he wants to be first. He wants to be the best. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a great attitude to have. Except you got to make sure that one, you're doing it all for the glory of God, right? And not, and not like, you know... When you're striving for the mastery, the Bible says that we need to do it lawfully. And in we ought to be considering uh, you know, all those of us around us. You know, it's, it's like the, um, you know, sports these days. You got team sports. And it's gotten to a point where people want to get so focused on themselves. You get these athletes where they completely forget the concept of a team. And they want it all to be about them at the expense sometimes even of the team just because they want to do their showboating and they want to get all the fame and the glory and everything for themselves. That's not the way it ought to be for us. And Jesus explains how we can be the greatest Christian, but just to have that desire is a good thing. Just say, hey, I, this is what I want to do. Now, don't let, if that's your attitude, don't let that get in the way of saying, well, here's someone else doing a lot. I need to push them down so I can go up. No. And in fact, if you do that, it's going to work the opposite way anyways. I mean, that's going to get you even lower in the kingdom of God just by, by having that type of an attitude. So you need to re remain humble. But let's keep going here in this story because he asks her, he says, you know, you know not what you ask in verse 22. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, we are able. So yes, we can. Which again, I think it's, a, it's a still a pretty good attitude. Like, yeah, we're, we're willing to go through anything. We'll do whatever we need to do to achieve this. And then Jesus answered him. He says, you shall indeed drink of my cup and be bapti baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it was prepared to my father. Saying like, okay, you know what? You, you will go through things that I'm going through. You will drink of my cup. You will be put to death. You will be martyred. You know, you... You will be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But that's still not mine to give any. You know, because they came in, you know, at, the end, at the end, he just has to say, my father's the one that's going to decide, you know, where, the, where people's place is going to be. It's not even mine to give. So, um, and, then he, and then he answers them here after he finds out, you know, the other 10 hear it and they're like grumbling about it. You know, they're getting kind of upset. Who do you think you are? And then Jesus explains even further. Look at verse number 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, 
and they that are great exercise authority upon them. So he's saying in the world, people who are in that hold high positions, right? They're asking for the position sitting on the right hand, left hand of Jesus Christ. Well, in the world, the people that sit in positions that would be similar to that on this earth, he's saying they're exercising authority. They're exercising dominion over the people that are underneath them. And that's their position that they're in. He's saying, but it's not the same. It shall not be so among you. So this is not the way to be great in the kingdom of God. It's not just to sit in this position and tell everyone else what to do and, and exercise authority and dominion over people. He said, that's not how you're going to make it and be the greatest Christian and to be lifted up to a position on the right hand or on the left hand of Jesus Christ. He said, it's not how it's going to happen. He says in verse 26, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. A minister is someone who serves, someone who's going to do something for you. See, typically, and that's what he's explaining, is that the rulers, they have servants, right? People who are in great positions of power and authority, they have people serving them and doing whatever they want. And Jesus is saying, look, if you want to be great, if you want to be the greatest Christian that's ever lived, then you need to be going out and serving other people, not having others serve you. Verse number 27, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So he explains to them, look, it's not a bad thing to want to be great in the kingdom of God. It's a good thing. You got your eyes focused in the right place. You're, you're, you want to lay up treasures for yourself in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and where thieves do not break forth and steal. You're thinking right. But in order to achieve that, in order to attain that, he said, this is how you do it. Don't look at the world's example because that's not how you do it. That's going to make you fail. So if you want to be considered great in the kingdom of God, then you have to become a servant. And he has himself as the perfect example. I mean, think about it. Jesus Christ has a name above all names. Jesus Christ is exalted above everybody. And Jesus Christ came to this earth. He says right here, not to be ministered unto, but to minister. He came forth as the example, giving himself his life as a ransom for many. He came, he came in and you know, he even at the, at the Last Supper with his disciples you know, put on, put on the towel and he, and he washed their feet and dried them with, with, the, with the towel they put on around them and, you know, completely humble. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Master of the disciples coming in and getting down on his hands and feet, on his hands and knees and, and washing his disciples' feet. Sarah, sit down in your chair. What an example of someone who actually had all the reason, all the authority to, to do, you know, to, to be in the position telling everyone else what to do and demonstrating the, um, the servitude and the ministry that he actually did and, and what he did to, to, um, to come and, and do that. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. I'll just read for you another quote from Matthew 23. Matthew 23, 11, the Bible says, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. If you haven't gotten it to this point, the, the, you know, talking about my servant is the greatest Christian. If you want to be great in God's eyes, if you want to end up being great in the kingdom of heaven, th there's, there's some things that we need to, uh, that we can look at. Now, we should all want to excel in our spirituality, our walk with God. And the exact place that God intends on using you in this lifetime is not going to be the same for everybody, right? There's different roles. There's different members of the body of Christ where God wants to use people in different capacities. But I'm going to be preaching on principles today that it doesn't matter where God has you placed and what he really wants you doing in this life specifically, you know, with, with your efforts and your focus to further the, the gospel and the kingdom of God. These principles will help you achieve the maximum for God 
no matter what it is he has you do, you know, whether you're pastoring, whether you're doing any leadership in the church, whether, you know, what, whatever it is that you're gifted with and the way that you're going to be promoting God. I mean, there's certain things like preaching the gospel that everyone should be doing. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of things that, that we all should be doing. But even specifically, if you're thinking about a specific job or a specific function, all of these principles are going to help you to be a better Christian in that area. And the first one is being humbled. If you want to be great, you need to become a servant. You need to have the mindset and the attitude that Jesus Christ had that says, I am going to serve people, not look for people to lift me up. And the Bible said, or Jesus Christ even said there in the verse I quoted in Matthew 23, he says, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. God doesn't like it when you go out trying to lift yourself up. You know, and, and this is... We live in a narcissistic society, again, with the social media stuff and this, this mindset where people want to have all of the likes. And, and we're seeing this weird phenomena with, with, in, it, with crime and with people just posting everything on the internet and have gotten to the point to where they want to, they'll do whatever they can to lift themselves up in the eyes of the public, in the eyes of everyone else, and just put themselves out there in weird ways, doing bizarre things, committing crimes or whatever, acting like a fool, just to get people to, to give you that like, to give you that thumbs up, and to give you that feeling of worth or whatever it is that people are doing this for. But they're lifting themselves up. You know, when they're doing it for that reason, obviously there's things you can post online, you're not trying to lift yourself up or whatever, you're sure you share things, but too many people are out there just trying to lift themselves up, get the spotlight on them, get the fame, you know, get everyone looking at them. And in the Christian life, you know, out in the world, I, I expect that. That's the way the world operates. But not in the house of God. If you want to be great in the house of God, if you want to be great in God's eyes, you're not going to go out lifting yourself up. I've seen this happen even in, in good churches. You know, people get a zeal, a lot of, especially younger men will get zealous about the things of God and they want to become a preacher and they see maybe some hard preaching from other pastors that are, that are up there and saying things and it's like, you know, the world's going crazy over some of the things that they said, but it is preaching the Bible, they're preaching the truth and, um, and they want to be, you know, they see all this, stuff, oh man, you know, and, and they get excited for the right reason. Say, here, yeah, here's someone who's not backing down. Here's someone who's preaching it the way it is. Amen and amen. That's good. But then they want to go and, and try to just, you know, mimic or do the, you know, I don't want to say mimic, but say things or try to preach for shock value instead of just preaching the truth of what needs to be said, right? The, the, the focus then becomes on the wrong thing. The focus becomes on, on what can I say that's going to get a whole bunch of people upset then that's going to get me notoriety in the world so that people can look at me and, and I'm standing for, you know, for something or whatever. And, 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 and it's more, becomes more about the, the turmoil and, the, and, and everything else that's caused in, in the hubbub online than it is about just getting God's message across. And this is something that, that is, um, I've seen it happen. And it could be, you know, it could be uh, dealt with very easily, especially within the local church um, with people just, just, not being given too much, you know, especially novices, not being put in too much the authority and being um, forced to, to just sit and listen and grow. But um, unfortunately, still, again, with the internet, people, everyone's got a podium, everyone's got a, a mouthpiece. But it is what it is, right? And if you say, yeah, I've seen that happen. I don't want that to happen to me, though. Then you need to keep a humble attitude. And you need, if you want to be great, if you want to be somebody, if you want to have some kind of a name in God's eyes, then you need to be humble. And you need to keep yourself low. Because if you try to exalt yourself, if you try to make some great name for yourself so that everyone looks at you, God will bring you down. God will abase you. But if you are humble and if you have an attitude and a heart and a spirit of helping other people out and it's not all about you, I mean, that's why, you know, the Bible says that uh, among them that the are born of women, there's not uh, risen greater than John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist was basically the greatest Christian that lived at the, up to that point other than Jesus Christ himself. Why? Because it wasn't about him. His entire ministry 
pointed people away from him. I mean, he was a voice crying in the wilderness. He was stirring things up. He was saying things that got people's attention. He had big crowds coming out to him in the wilderness and people wanting to get baptized of him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests coming out to him and seeing what's this guy doing, this crazy guy wearing his leather belt and eating locusts and wild honey, you know, and, and who is this guy and who does he think he is, all this stuff. And his whole ministry was dedicated to saying, hey, behold the Lamb of God. Hey, follow this guy. Hey, follow Jesus Christ. That's who it's all about. It was never about him. His own disciples, you know, people following him, he's saying, hey, follow him. Follow Jesus. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus. That's why he was considered the greatest among them that are born of women. Because of his humble attitude. And that's why John the Baptist is lifted up in God's eyes. Because he never made it about himself ever. Not, not from what we have recorded in Scripture. It was all about Jesus Christ. He had the attitude of, you know, he must increase, talking about Jesus Christ, but I must decrease. His stature. He prepared the way of the Lord. He was getting things ready. And when Jesus Christ came on the scene, he's like, okay, I'm out. This is the main attraction. And that's, that's the attitude that you need to have if you want to be great in God's eyes. If you truly want to have, uh, you know, be exalted. You need to be willing to go and be very low for, uh, for God to exalt you. You're in Philippians chapter number two because Jesus Christ gave us the best example of being a servant. He humbled himself and now has a name above all names. Look at verse number three of Philippians two. The Bible says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. This goes exactly to the point I was just talking about of, you know, a lot of zealous you know, people who are zealous but without knowledge, zealous of good work, zealous of doing uh, good things and, and copying and seeing what, you know, what's being done by the hard preachers. But they do it with more of a mentality of stirring things up and causing problems and fightings or getting vain glory on themselves. The Bible says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. It's not about causing problems. It's not about, you know, bringing attention to yourself. It's about standing for what's right and standing for God's word. There's a big difference there. We're not to be contentious. You know, the great preachers don't go out just looking for fights with people and just trying to say whatever they could say to just make everybody mad. It's more of, you know, events happen or things happen in this world and they say, this is what the Bible says, this is what's true and this is what's right. You don't have to go out of your way to try to upset people because that's not the point. It's not about the vainglory. It's not about the contentions. To let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. The attitude that we have to have is that I am esteem, you know, and it doesn't, esteeming others better than yourselves doesn't mean that you have your, you know, view yourself with no value. That's not what that means. You can, you can have good esteem for yourself in the sense that you know that you're a child of God. You know that God's got a plan for you. You know that what the work that you're doing is important and good and right and that you have a great job to do and a great task to do and there's a lot of value to that. But what it says here is esteem others better than yourself. So as much as you know, hey, I've got a lot of good things to do. I've got a lot of work to do. And this is all good and God wants me doing this stuff and God has a value on my head. You know, um, I'm going to view other people as being more important than myself. It doesn't cheapen or lessen your value. It's just your mindset. It's the way that you view things. It's the way that you view other people and saying, I'm going to value other people more than me. Because the opposite is, is being proud and being lifted up and thinking you're better than other people. The way you combat pride is to have the mindset of, they're better than me. I'm not better than them. That's, that's what it's meaning here when it says you esteem other people better than themselves. Jesus Christ had that mindset. He was esteeming other people better than himself. I mean, he went through all kinds of stuff that he, that he, would he have to go through that stuff? No. Should he have had to go through that stuff? You don't know. He already had his position. He's a son of God. But he esteemed you better. He, he valued you. He, he went through everything he went through for you and for the whole world. Verse 4, let not every man 
Look, excuse me, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is what Jesus Christ did. This is what he took on himself and did for us because he esteemed others better than himself. He was willing to go through so much. He says, even unto death and even the death of the cross. The death of the cross was a very shameful death. It was something that was looked down upon because that's what they did with criminals. And Jesus Christ was charged as a criminal and hung with other malefactors, with other criminals, thieves on the cross. And that, that was his company when they put him to death. It was disgraceful in this world. But he did all of that because it wasn't, he, when he came to this earth, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to offer himself a ransom for many. It was not about him and exalting himself and setting up his kingdom. It was about everybody else. That was his first intent. That's what he came here for. And that is the example that we need to follow if we want to be great in the sight of God. Um, verse 9. So because of this, because of all these things, he made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a servant. He suffered the death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. Why? He humbled himself, so God lifted him up. He humbled himself and did good and did right and didn't make it all about him. He made it about everybody else. So God lifted him up. God exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because of the humility that Christ had, God says, you are, you know, you're going to have every knee, every, you know, bow to you. Everyone's going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and it's all going to bring glory unto God. God the Father. Just as a side note, I don't see how people can be reading the scripture and look at all this and say that Jesus Christ is the Father and that it's just all the same person. I mean, that's, like, this is just, there's so many examples of this in scripture, but I'm not going to get off on that subject. I mean, this is, so, what a great passage here about Jesus Christ being exalted from the, from because of the, the humility that he had. Verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I can't stress enough the importance of being humble, being, uh, you know, having that lowly spirit, having a spirit of ministering and serving. That is the example Jesus left for us, and, and we see how God treats the name of Jesus Christ. And if you want to be exalted in the kingdom of God, if you want to be in a great position and uh, be rewarded, the way to do that is to have the right heart in service unto other people. Now, when you do your work, because God has work for us to do, all of us to do, part of being humble is having the right attitude, right? As it goes down to your heart and, and, and thinking about things the right way and serving in the right way. Not having an attitude of, oh, I just have to do this. It's my job. You know, like people have all this bad attitude about going to work in general. Oh, man, I gotta, can't wait till this is over. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to, you know, scrub the toilets. I got to pick up trash. I got to pick up other people's garbage. You know, whatever. You have this bad attitude of, well, I'm just going to get this over with and, and then, you know, go about the rest of my life. That's not the attitude that we ought to have when you serve God. God may have you doing a lot of, a lot of jobs for him, or, you know, put you in situations and deal with people and deal with things that may not be very pleasant. But what your attitude is, is going to go a long way. If you want to have a, you know, succeed 
You need to make sure you don't have a bad attitude and that you give it your best. Look at verse 14 here in Philippians chapter 2. The Bible says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. So everything that we should be doing, you shouldn't be complaining, which is what murmuring is. You know, muttering under your breath, I don't know, I have to do this, you know. Uh, I don't know what, you know, lady, I don't know why my husband's making me do this. Complaining and murmuring and disputings, fightings. Look, when you're doing things, just do it. When, when you've got a job to do, don't complain about it. Don't argue about it. Just do it. Verse 15, why? That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. You are to be living as an example. And when you murmur and complain and argue and fight about the work that you need to do, that brings a bad name on you. It brings a bad name on Christ. We're supposed to be lights. We're supposed to be the examples. We're supposed to say, you know what? Maybe bad things will happen, but I'm going to have the right attitude. I'm going to have the right heart. I'm going to work through this, and I'm going to be blameless and harmless in the work that I do. Verse 16, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And what that verse is teaching there is that you know, being a light shining in the world and holding forth the word of life. If you're doing the work for God and you're complaining and fighting and murmuring, you might just be working in vain. God's going to look at that and say, no, it's not just the work that you're doing, it's your attitude. It's the humility. It's being blameless. It's being harmless. It's being without rebuke. That's the way, you know, God gives you a job to do. It's not just the job that needs to get done. It's the way that you do it is all important. Because if you're just doing a job and, you know, the work that you're doing, because it's so important and, and the way that people perceive it and look at, at the work that you're doing, if you're just always complaining about it, you could be doing more damage than good. Other people look at that and say, well, I don't want to do that. I mean, look at this guy. He's just complaining and in a, you know, has a bad attitude all the time. Why would I want to do the work that he's doing? Why would I want to get involved with that and turn a whole bunch of people off about it? Instead of just doing it, nope, this is the right thing. I'm going to serve God with my whole heart. I'm going to do things heartily as unto the Lord, as it says in Colossians chapter 3. Do all things heartily. And that's in reference just to regular work. You know, if you have a master, you go have a boss, and you go off to work. He says, do all things heartily as unto the Lord. So when you work at your job, do it like you're working for God and have a good attitude about it, and just do your work. And that's the example that a Christian needs to have, and that's what God, that's what the Bible is telling us that we need to be doing if we're going to succeed, and if we're going to have a name that God's going to hold in high regard. And you know what? Doing that, some, that's, you definitely have to have a humble attitude in order to not be offended, in order to not think, oh man, you're wasting my time and everything else. It's funny, there's a, there's a situation that happened quite a while ago at my work where you know, I'm, a, I'm a computer programmer, and, um, but I work for a small, small business, small company, and work out of an office, and you know, there's, there's different chores and things that just need to be done. When you have people working together, you know, if bathrooms need to be cleaned, you've got you know, lunch areas need to be cleaned up, things like that, right? Just simple jobs. And um, people get all upset because some people don't always do the job. Look, anytime I've ever been given a job, I'll just do it. You know, my boss, if my boss wants me to go clean the toilets, I'm not going to say, I went to college. I'm a programmer. Yeah, you think I'm going to clean that toilet? I don't think so, but, you know, and have this type of ad, this proud, lifted up, exalt you. The way I look at it, you want to pay me, the salary you pay me to go clean a toilet? Fine, I'll go clean a toilet. I mean, whatever it is that you want me to do, I'll go do it because I'm not above the work. I'm not above the job that you have for me to do. And we need to have that attitude in general at our jobs, in our life, whatever God has for us, whatever man has for you, the work that you're supposed to be doing. You're not above it. Just do the work and do what's right. And you know, when you have that type of an attitude, this plays out in real life, just in the real world, because it's, God, because it's the word of God. But you'll see it. Try it out for yourself. Have a good attitude at your job. 
Work really hard as if God is your boss. Don't complain about your job to anybody. And come in and have a good attitude and be willing to serve. And when your job's done, you get your job done early. What else can I do for you, sir? You have that type of an attitude, guess what? You will be exalted over time. It will happen. Because people see that and they say, that's the type of worker that I want working for me. They'll see the value in the hard worker and they'll give you even more things to do. And they'll lift you up and say, yeah, this guy's on time. This guy's not complaining. He's able to do this job. Whatever I tell him to do, he's doing it. I want him doing more important things now. That's the way it works. Try it out. It works that way in the real world. And you know what? It works that way with God. God has work for you to do in service for him. He's going to see what your attitude is. He's going to see how you do things. Turn if you go to 1 Peter chapter 5. And he's going to decide what more work you can do for him. 1 Peter chapter 5. We need to keep a humble attitude. We need to do things heartily without complaining, have the right mindset. And also, if you want to be great, you're going to need to, to learn how to, you know, part of not complaining and not having a bad attitude is getting with the program, right? Like I said, if, it, if, it's, if it's at work, you need to get on the program that your boss is on. Because you start fighting with him and everything else, you're not going to succeed. You're not going to be lifted up. You have this, this attitude of, well, I, you know, they're everyone, you know, my boss is doing things wrong. Or ladies, my husband does things wrong. Or in, in church, the pastor does everything wrong. Okay? Whatever your situation is, that is the wrong attitude to have. And when we're in church, you need to get on the program of the church. And I know there's a lot of people that listen to sermons on the internet that don't actually physically come to this church, and they need to take heed to this too because... You know, you can't be going into churches. Look, you got to find a good, a real church, obviously. Somewhere where the gospel is being preached, where the, where the word of God, the kingdom of the Bible is being used, right? You, you, you have things that identify what even is a church. I'm not saying go into a Pentecostal church and just get with the program over there. Where they're teaching works-based salvation, you can lose your salvation, they're, they're possessed with devils and everything else. But when you find a good, you know, a decent church, a church that's doing right by God, a church that's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's got salvation right, that's got the right word of God, that's, you know, that's doing the right things, get in, sit down, and shut up, and do some work, and be a blessing to that church. And that's for this church or any other church that's, that's doing a work for God. Go in and be a blessing to that church. That's the attitude that God wants you to have. Get with the program. 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to see in verse number 1, of course, the apostle Peter was also an elder. He was a, he was a pastor of a church. And now in, in the beginning of chapter 5, he's going to exhort other pastors, other elders. Look at verse number 1, 1 Peter 5, 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So his first message is to the pastors on how they ought to be running a church. Okay, and just like it is with husbands and wives, he's, he's going to be teaching here to pastors and just you know, church members. Okay, there are roles for each to play. There's a role for a husband to play. There's a role for a wife to play. If one is not doing their role the way that the Bible says so, it doesn't change your role. If your spouse isn't doing what their role is according to Scripture, that doesn't change your role. So what that means is, yo, know, ladies, if your husband isn't being loving, isn't doing the things, he's, you know, isn't a leader, isn't, isn't you know, providing for you, isn't doing the things that the Bible says that he should be doing, that doesn't mean you just, well, I'm just going to take charge. I'm going to do everything. I'm going to be the spiritual head of the household. No, you still do your role. 
And it's the same way the other way around. You know, husbands, your, your wife isn't being submissive. She's not, you know, doing the things you tell her to do. She's not, you know, not, not filling her role. Husbands, you still have the same job. You still love your wife. You still be not bitter against them. You still do, you know, what you're supposed to be doing, what scripture says that you have to do. So keep that in mind when we apply that to the church here, because this is what he's doing. And the, the apostle Peter is saying, you know, first of all, pastors, your job is to feed the flock, right? You're supposed to be taking the word of God and delivering the message and giving them good information, good knowledge, good doctrine, feeding the flock to equip and to prepare them and to help them and, and to, to guide them in their, in their walk with God and Christ. A good pastor is going to be a minister and helping the people of the church and helping teach them and help showing them, hey, this is what the Bible says. This is right. This is wrong. To help them. It's not about you and, and being a dictator and just running everything with an iron fist inside the church. He says, no, actually, it's the opposite. So don't take it by constraint. Do it willingly. Have an attitude that you want to serve, that you want to pastor these people, that you want to watch over the flock. You're not doing it because you have to. Someone forced you to do it because you want to be there. You're willing. You're having a good work attitude. You feed the flock. And he says, not for filthy. You don't do it for money. You do it for the right reasons. You have a ready mind. And he says, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. He's saying the way that you run the church is not by just having this iron fist and just telling everybody what to do. It's by being an example. That's the way that an elder ought to run the church. In order to teach, you better be well knowledge. You better know your Bible. And if you want people doing things, you better be willing to do the work yourself and showing them how to do it, not just telling them what to do. Now, look, are there pastors out there that are not following what, what Peter was saying here to other pastors? Absolutely. There's other churches being run differently that may not, the, the pastors aren't doing their job. But does that change the role of the person sitting in the pew? No, it doesn't. No, you know, nobody's perfect, first of all. You may have problems with some of the things that I say or believe or the way I run things or whatever, but this is a position that God has given me to do. Verse 4 says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elders. So now this is, this is the people who are not the elders, right? These are people who are younger in the faith. They're younger in, uh, you know, spiritually. They ought to be, you know, the, the person running the church ought to be elder spiritually. Likewise, younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. This is people within the church. The younger people who, you know, you ought to be subject to the elder for sure. And then also to one another. Don't be lifted up and thinking that you're better than someone else. Someone else is newer in the church or whatever. You know, it's, it's having this right attitude. Having this, this, uh, this attitude of serving others. Really submit yourselves. Be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you there's structure in the church just like there's structure in your family now it's up to you individually to determine if you're going to follow that structure or to rebel and this is the way the bible does everything everything's will everything you have free will to choose what you're going to do are you going to fill the role that 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 is outlined in the, in the authority structure in the bible or not you have that choice at the end of the day, no, you know, no, no matter how much I could say or whatever, you know, I could tell my wife, hey, you need to be submissive. You need to follow. This is what the Bible says. This is what's right. You know, she has free will to determine what she's going to do. And at the end of the day, there's nothing I, I could do about it. I mean, I could, I could do, you know, keep on doing what I do. But, you know, it's not like, you know, it, if you're following the Bible, it's not like, I'm going to threaten her with, with like bodily harm or death or something if she doesn't obey. You know what I mean? Like that's not the where, where, where scripture is saying that you need to just, you know, if you don't, follow, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, I'm going to kill you, right? Like, no, that's not, you know. So at the end of the day, there's, you know, you do what you can do, but, but it's up to people individually to go with it, you know? And 
that's the way that God has given, you know, that's why he's given us a free will. It's up to us to choose. What are we going to do? Everything at church is voluntary. How many times you attend church? It's wholly voluntary, right? Uh, I think God gives us, you know, God's word gives us um, instruction on that. God outlines what we should be doing in here. But you're never forced to do anything. We don't have forced soul winning. We don't have forced, you know, attendance activities. We don't have forced anything. The jobs that people do here in the church, being ushers and, and helping out, doing Bible reading, you know, people would be leading songs. It's all, it's all voluntary. Everything that you do here is voluntary. You're never forced to do anything. But if you have a mindset and if you have a goal, you want this church to succeed, just like if you want your marriage to succeed, we need to be in the roles that God has given for us. We need to get on board, get with the program. You want your marriage to succeed? Get with the program that God's outlined for your role individually. Men lead. You know, women follow. It's, it's pretty that simple as far as in the home. I mean, there's a lot more, there's more to it, but that's a real, real basic summary. In church, you know, you've got a pastor that's in charge of running the church and the congregation following the lead, the example that's being set forth. We, in this church, can only do as much as you are willing to do. If you want this to be a great church and do a great work for God and turn the world upside down, you know, we read how exciting that is in the book of Acts. Word of Truth Baptist Church being a lighthouse shining forth for God and just, and just you know, building up the name of Jesus Christ as a church that will not back down, a church that's going to proclaim the word of God in truth and in honesty and having good behavior and, and, and demonstrating, wow, this is what a church member of Word of Truth Baptist looks like it, out and around town, in your community, wherever, on the internet, anywhere. This is how a per, you know, someone acts at Word of Truth Baptist Church. We can only do so, as much as you're willing to do. If you want the, the extent and our reach to, to reach more people, you need to get involved. It's up to you. You need to do more soul winning. You need, you know, look, I'm, I'm going to be the right there with you. We will do a lot, but individually you have to determine what you want to do. If the church, if your church is offering opportunities to serve, you ought to seize those opportunities and follow the lead of the church leadership. If you really want to excel, turn if you would to Luke 16. Luke 16. If you really want to excel and minister in this church, you need to get involved. Not just in attending activities and things like that, but get involved helping out with those activities. And look, I'm not... This isn't against any, you know, believe me, I, I have like nobody in mind for this at all. It's just something that, that is the truth that people need to, to just realize. You know, everything that we do here, it's all volunteer. We, do, we try to do a lot of fun things. And, and I get, we get a lot of help. So, I'm, you know, I don't think this is like a problem at our church, but I'm just bringing it up because it's important, you know, that we, ha we have this mindset of always helping out. So when you come to church in general, the right mindset when you go to any church is what can I do for this church instead of, what can church just do for me? You know, so many people, we go out, I, you know, we go out sewing, we talk to people, well, what programs does your church have? What do you have for my kids to do? What do you have for me to do? You know, what programs do you have that I can benefit from from your church? That is the wrong, if you want to succeed and be great in the eyes of God, that's the wrong attitude to have. That is the complete opposite attitude to have. Now look, do people have that attitude? Yes, they do. Is that, you know, th is that the way the world thinks? Absolutely, that's the way the world thinks. But that's not the way that you ought to think. When you come to church, you ought to be thinking, how can I help this church? How can I do, well, what can I offer? What services do I have? What skills do I have? How can I be a blessing? What can I do more to help? To help church and to serve the Lord. We try to plan, you know, activities and things like that. 
you know, don't just show up to the activities, get involved with the activities, get involved with, with, the, with the preparation, with the cleanup, with everything else that you can do, whatever it is that you can do to be a blessing and to help, that is the attitude that we ought to have, and that's going to allow us to do even more things. You know, for relying, if, if, if everybody had the attitude of, well, I don't want to do any work, I just want to receive, in this church, there's going to be very little that we do. Because if everyone has that attitude, if there's only one person that doesn't have that attitude that's willing to be a minister and to serve, then you're only going to be able to do as much as that one person can do. And that's it. But it's where's your heart? What do you want to do? How do you want the church to be? If you have any desire, and here, here's another thing, getting a little more specific on the roles, if you have any desire to have any type of leadership role here, you have to be reliable. If you, want, if you, if you have this desire, you want to be a pastor one day, or you want to have you know, any type of role where you're going to be leading in any capacity, you have to be dependable. Now, being dependable is good, no matter what, I mean, no matter what you're doing, whether you want to be a leader or not, you know, you ought to have the quality of being faithful or being dependable. But for sure, definitely in this church, if you want to have any type of position of leadership, you have to be reliable. Look at uh, Luke 16, verse number 10. The Bible says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? And this is a great principle, a great rule to live by. You know, he that is faithful in that which is least, that's someone who's dependable, someone you can rely on, someone that, that is going to be faithful in the little things. It's not even that important. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah, but if you can show yourself that you have the character to be dependable, even on something that doesn't really matter that much, it's just some small thing, but you say, hey, I know when so-and-so, I, I asked them to do this little thing for me, this little, you know, and it got done. When you demonstrate the ability to be faithful, and you're faithful in the smallest things, that proves you're going to be faithful in the bigger things. Because people have a tendency, you know, the small things, oh, it's not that important, I'm just going to blow it off, right? I know someone asked me to do this, but it's not that big of a deal anyways, so whatever. If you have that type of an attitude, do you want to rely on someone like that to do something great for you when, when something actually big comes up? Wow, I need, to, I need to someone to help me out with this. Well, I'm not, I mean, this person blew off the last thing I, I tried to give him, and it wasn't even that big of a deal. You see what I'm saying? This, this applies to all capacities of life. On the job, in church, wherever. Having this, it's this attitude, it's this mindset of being faithful, being reliable, being dependable in the little things. And that's why it says, look, if you've, been un, uh, not, uh, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, talk about like money, if you've just been a complete waster and everything else and just, just not been reliable, not been dependable on handling unrighteous mammon, the Bible says, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Because let's face it, money isn't, isn't that valuable. It's necessary. There's things that we need to use money for in our life, and we ought to handle it wisely. But those aren't the true riches. But if you're not even able or capable of, of managing and handling something that doesn't have that much value, like, like you know, the money of this world, who's going to commit to your trust? And see, this is what it is, is being trustworthy, dependable, reliable, faithful. These are the words being used. This is what this is talking about, the true riches. If you can't even manage, you know, unrighteous mammon. And, so if you, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, right, you're working for someone else, they own stuff, and they, they are employing you to do some work for them, and you don't care, well, it's not mine, I don't care anyways. Who shall give you that which is your own? You know, people have this attitude like, uh, you know, renters. It's a common, a common attitude among people who rent. You know, they don't have their own house. They don't have their own place. But they're going to go in and rent from somebody else. They're going to go into the house and say, oh, well, it's not my house. I don't care. Put holes in the wall. Do, you know, leave the place trashed or whatever. 
If you have that type of an attitude, guess what? You're never going to get your own house. You may think, well, how could that even be? Because we have a God in heaven that, that's a God of justice. And you reap what you sow. And besides just someone, you know, even if someone doesn't see you being like that, you know, your landlord may not have, you know, the, the control to not allow you to get a house somewhere else. But you just having that mindset and that attitude, you're never, you're not going to succeed anyways. Because that's not going to be the only area you're failing in. People are going to see you lacking in that, in that skill, that quality of faithfulness, that character of being faithful and dependable and reliable in things that are not your own. And no one's going to commit to your trust uh, the greater riches. You have to be proven to be able to handle the small task before you're ever going to be considered for a larger task. Got a couple more points here. If you want to be a great Christian, right? It's, it's all about the attitude. That's the main point of the sermon this morning, is having a humble attitude, being willing to serve, and no matter how big or small the job is, making sure you see it through to the end, get it done, no complaining, no you know, murmuring about it, but doing the work that needs to get done. And if you want to be successful, you need to get planted in church. You need to get rooted down. You need to decide where you think is the best place for God to use you and then make a commitment. Like be in that church. Decide this is where we're going to be because the church is a body and we're members in particular. The Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians that, that we are a body. And, you know, we've had people in here before. We had a person that, that was you know, coming to our church, but also going to another church. It doesn't make sense to be part of two separate bodies. Because our church, we're an independent church. This is a body right here. And if you're going to do the maximum for God, you need to determine where you're going to be going. You know, what body do you want to be joined to? It's detrimental to the body as well as to the member to not be joined to one body. It really is. If you want to be, you know, think about, you know, the person who's going to multiple churches, how could any of those bodies rely on you as a member when you're, when you're being, you know, you're, you're, you're split between multiple bodies? And it, you know, it always is going to have to boil down to something. You know, with the, the person that was coming here for a while, he, he ended up leaving. But, you know, there, there, there has to be a point where you're just saying, you know what, I'm committed here. Because otherwise, you know, it's, it's like being double-minded. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You need, to, you need to determine, this is where I'm going to be. This is where I'm going to serve the Lord. Get rooted down, get established, and start working. And start being that faithful member. Now, look. Do we have a rule here that says if you're going to another church, you can't, you know, of course not. And at the end of the day, do I want people doing whatever they can do? Hey, if you, you know, like you want to go to two different churches, go ahead. But I don't think that that's going to be the best way that you're going to be able to serve God. It's just like, you know, doing anything good. Okay, go, attending church, that's a good thing. Great. I'm not going to knock you for going to church, especially a good church. But if you want to do the best, if you want to be the, the greatest, um, you're gonna, you, you need to get plugged in. It's just like soul winning. You, know? you want to go out soul winning, great. I'm not going to knock you for doing a good thing. But if you're coming to this church and we have established soul winning times and you want to just go off and do soul winning just completely on your own outside of what this church is doing at the same time the church has a soul winning time, you know, that's, that's not... That's not a way to be a good member of this church. Praise God if you're getting people saved, but like when you join a church or you're part of a church, then get on the program with the church. It's the same thing with, you know, living really, really far away from a church. You know, people do what they need to do. I know it's a lot of people in different you know, circumstances and stuff, but... Uh, if you really want to be a good servant and member of a church and do the most to help the church, then you ought to be local. You ought to be close. You know, um, it's more than just showing up to a church service and hearing preaching. Our church has a lot more to do with than than just that. 
you know, we're, we're supposed to be here for each other. If other members have problems, you know, to be able to help one another out. If you truly want to minister, you're going to have that attitude of helping other people out. Well, if you live super far away, how are you going to do that? How are you really going to be plugged in and get involved when you're not, um, when you're not here and you're not able to be here for others in the church? My last point is, goes in a little bit to leadership. But I'm not, and this, is, this could be a whole sermon in and of itself. It really is. But um, if you want to lead effectively, if you want to be a great Christian and you want to be a leader, you have to learn how to follow. All of the, you know, so many examples of great leaders in the Bible were, were first great followers. You have Joshua as an example of that. Joshua was a great leader. He led the children of Israel into the promised land, right? After a moment, Moses wasn't able to, but do you know what he did? He served and was, was ministering to Moses all the way up until the day he died before the torch was passed to him and he became a great leader. You have even King David, was ministering to King Saul. And King Saul was a wicked king. And if anybody has a good testimony, it's David about someone who is able to follow, able to get in his role, able to get in his position, even with someone who wasn't doing their job properly, who didn't do everything right. He did his job. He did it without complaining. He did what he was supposed to be doing. And you know what? God saw that. God saw how faithful he was, how dependable he was, and God lifted him up and made him be a great leader. Elisha, we're going through uh, 2 Kings now. We're reading a lot of stories about Elisha. Elisha's an awesome man of God, great man of God. Got a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. Why? Because he served Elijah. Because he was there for him. He poured water over Elijah's hands. He was there to minister unto Elijah up until the day that God took him. And never backed off of him. Never just stopped following him. Oh, well, God's going to take you anyways. No, he followed him all the way to the end. And was faithful all the way to the end. And he was blessed, and he ended up being a great man of God. And then finally, with uh, Jesus and the apostles. I mean, look at all the apostles. We're reading, we're reading from you know, the, the, the epistle of, of Peter, the apostle Peter. Great leader. But he followed the example of Jesus Christ. All of them did. They were following Jesus. They were following him wherever he went. They were, they were right with him. They learned from him. They, they sat under the teaching of Jesus all the way up until the time where it was time for them to have their own leadership. But they were humble the whole way through and, and weren't complaining about not having a place to stay or anything like that. They just served with Jesus. And they served happily. And if you want to be a great leader, like the great leaders of the Bible, you need to learn how to be a great follower and, and be a minister and be humble and have the mindset of serving other people because the greatest leaders are going to serve by example anyways and not just be some total dictator. You're going to be doing the work and showing the work that needs to be done instead of just telling people what to do. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the instruction that we can receive from your words. Lord, I pray that you please help us all to have the the desire, first and foremost, to, to want to be a great Christian, dear Lord, to want to, to serve you to the utmost. And God, I pray that you please help us to do so properly and appropriately, dear Lord, that um, we, could, we could ultimately just have the right mindset, have a minister's heart, dear Lord, to serve other people, to, to go out and to love the lost and to, and to preach the gospel unto them and to love the other members of our church and to be willing to, to help out when people have a need, dear Lord pray that you would please just um, strengthen our church and, um, and help us to do, as a, as a body here, a great work for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.